This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad. Yourself? Doing great, man. The keynote sessions were great this morning. A healthy dose of pass keys with our friend Andrew Shikiar from the Fido Alliance. Um, I did want to mention we are at Identiverse recording, so the month of June is pretty much going to be the sessions that we record here this week. And uh, yeah, let's get it going, man. Yeah. So the first of these conversations that were actually a second, I should say, right, where we did our open festi- opening festivities kind of thing last night, turned out pretty well. I'm kind of happy with the way that worked out. Uh, and now we have a conversation with a fine gentleman from One Cosmos. We've got Josefa Aliyev, who's the chief operating officer for One Cosmos. And we've got old friend of the show, not that he's old, Mike Engel, <laughs> uh, chief strategy officer for One Cosmos. Welcome back to the show, Mike, and welcome to the show for the first time, Josefa. How, are you, guys, how are you doing today, Josefa? Thank you. Thanks for inviting. This is my first time, long time listener, first time on the show. So <laughs> I'm excited, right? I did my little happy dance as well. <laughs> well, we're excited uh, to have you here for sure. We're going to get to your origin story. Mike, um, you've been here before. You were with us an episode, well, a few episodes at this point. There was one, though, that I think, Jim, you wanted to highlight was episode number 96. Is that right? Yeah, episode 96. You know, um, Mike was on the, just talking about uh, kind of password lists and, Identity proofing. There was another episode where you were talking about your role on fourteen fourteen ventures, but do want to highlight that because we're going to go back to pass for lists and identity verification and talk about that as kind of our main topic today. Yeah, and so we're we have a conversation, Mike. We already know your origin story. We'll point people back to that episode so we can get right to it. But Josefa, you're on the hot seat now because it's your first time here. Tradition is that we learn people's identity origin story when they join us for the first time. So what is your origin story when it comes to IAM? Is it something that you chose or uh, did it choose you? So I did choose IAM, um, but uh, I have to be uh, honest, I didn't know the extent of what I was choosing. So my first job was uh, out of college and um, I I was uh, employed as an admin. Um, I was running bad jobs, running endpoint management software. Uh, at that time, um, CEO was pretty big, right, on endpoint management. So I was, you know, uh, for about a year I was doing that. And then there was an opportunity that came in with uh, the great SOX 404 compliance and said, you don't have to worry about these batch scripts. All you have to do is, you know, get these reports of access for users. You know, you circulate it with different managers and, and tell them that, you know, do you, is that right? Is that not wrong? I said, that sounds easy. That sounds exciting. Um, and that was my first foray into it. So I chose, and then, um, you know, one thing led to another, right? And, uh, you know, how do you get the access? How do you manage the access? And never looked back since then. So I've never heard the words great and socks in the same sentence before. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your chief operating officer, one of the things that fascinates me about this business are titles. And I'm curious, what does a chief operating officer do for an identity company like One Cosmos? Uh, nutshell, the right hand talks to the left hand, <laughs> but mainly making sure that, uh, you know, as organizations and especially startups, um, we tend to grow pretty rapidly and um, sometimes or most of the times there's a lot of chaos right, in rapidly growing organizations. So how do you try to keep that in order? How do you make sure that uh, every function, every department is, um, you know, going towards the overall vision of the company? Um, and making sure that that particular vision is also very clear with, uh, you know, every department and every member. Mike, I think um, for people who aren't familiar with One Cosmos, I know you've kind of given the spiel before, but what's the like the 30 second or maybe I'll give you 60 seconds to give us the elevator pitch. What does One Cosmos do? What's the problem you guys solve? Yeah, well, starting with the Genesis story and including the name, Cosmos is Greek for universe. And the idea is someday we will have one identity in the entire universe, right? So when Elon lands that uh, spaceship on Mars, you'll use your identity to prove who you are and get into the the little bubble that he builds. And so uh, there's a couple of standards that we all know and love that we've talked about on the show quite a bit. And um, we're going to talk about those here today. But that was the principle of the company is let's figure out one way 
to prove who you are and use that everywhere you have to engage online. That was a great analogy, Mike. Um, this week, we're focusing on the future of identity, and we came up with this term, Nostradamus Week, right? We want to talk about how things are going to be in the future. And one of the topics that you're hearing a lot about at Identiverse this week, Andre brought it up in his um, keynote yesterday, was this idea of like user-centric, user-managed identity is going to replace the corporate IDP managed identity in the future, right? So people are going to have control over their identity. That's going to change the game. So mix that in with kind of the buzz terms of the industry, self-sovereign identity and decentralized identity. Throw in the tips of everyone's tongue and kind of want to get your ideas and your thoughts on, you know, how reality, how real is that? What's it going to be like in the future? Where are we at today to, to start us off? But where do you see it four or five years down the road? Well, uh, I'll answer your question with a question. When you get pulled over by a state trooper, not that you ever have, but hypothetically, or you go up to the TSA checkpoint, how do you prove who you are today? TSA checkpoint, uh, yeah, it's both with a plastic card. Plastic card, it's a credential, and they look at your face and look at the credential and say they match. And uh, we know that we can do that online, and I would like to spend some time diving into the mechanics of that and the privacy of that so as, we, as we have this discussion today. But the future of identity must involve biometrics. And I'm not just talking about Touch ID and Face ID. Right? I could have five fingerprints on my iPhone 8. That could belong to anybody. But real biometrics. So that state trooper looks you in the face. You need to do that digitally as well. And there's ways to do it that are safe. But of course... We have had a number of uh, setbacks from a PR perspective with state legislation like BIPA, if you're familiar with the Illinois um, lawsuits that are going on that are setting us back, things that happen with the IRS, et cetera. So um, the future is a combination of privacy, biometrics, and you mentioned self-sovereign. Um, the term's getting a little old. These, you know, It's like nobody really knew what it may, meant when it came out. Are you really creating your own identity? Well, it's user managed is the term that I like to really use. If you're in control of it, nobody else can use it. So uh, that brings up wallets and the ability to put a credential somewhere safe that we'll talk about here today as well. Do you think three, four, five, maybe 10 years down the road, we don't carry physical you know, wallets in our pocket anymore and, and have you know, plastic driver's licenses that everything is smart enabled and put on phones? Is that only for people who are, you know, modern and use smartphones? Where, where do you see us? Where is it? What's the evolution look like? Yeah. As the, uh, older generation, um, is not the primary user of technology anymore. I'll try to say it nicely. Right. Uh, you'll see now everybody will have a, a device or be comfortable with using biometrics, right? If I try getting my dad, you know, who's 80 years old, to use his phone to do something, it's really hard for him. Uh, so that generation will will be less and less of the of the majority online. And I think it 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 must go to a digital form. We can't plastic is copyable, right? Forged documents are really hard to detect. You have AI that can now spoof all kinds of things. So we have a lot of challenges we have to work with. But it has to go digital because uh, the the bad guys know how to digitally manipulate everything as well. So who's Zephyr? This question's for you. Um, what, what's going to take to make this happen? You know, what is it? Is it just time that it has to kind of percolate? And then what are the big challenges? What are the big enemies to, to this happening? Maybe it's what Mike brought up there with, you know, just generational and not ready. I mean, my father doesn't have a smartphone. You know, he's still using his flip phone. Um, so what, what, what's it going to take to make this happen? You know, that vision that Mike just painted and what are the roadblocks or the stumbles? Yeah. So in, in some areas, in some geographies, it's already happening. Right? Uh, maybe not to the entire extent of the population. But, uh, for example, um, you mentioned you need to carry a wallet. Right? Uh, and in, in a lot of other geographies, everything is on your smartphone now, including your driver's license. Um, so one big proponent of that has been uh, the, the governments. 
So I know that there are certain European countries, India, where you get a driver's license and a copy of that onto your phone. Um, you have your payments onto your wallet as well. Um, so one big proponent of that is even your you know, government issuing your credentials right, that is consumable into your smart device. Right? And over a period of time, that's going to be uh, uh, more encompassing. And then if you look at it, um, you have to look at it with, uh, with, the, with keeping your customer identity use cases and then your enterprise. I think enterprise will be a little bit slower to adapt just because there's more control that I need. I need you know, to have an Azure credential or an AD credential that I want to use to provision an account. But um, if I'm shopping online, if I am uh, you know, signing up for any kind of a government service, I want... Uh, the ease of you know signing to go through the identity verification once, right, and then use my wallet to sign up for multiple different services, and then as a service provider on the consumer side, I also don't want to take on the liability of managing millions of different you know identities or accounts. Right? So if there is more of a common framework that is available, they be ready to essentially use that. Help me understand the wallets a little bit. So on my iPhone, I've got a wallet. It's part of the iOS operating system. It organizes, you know, I've got credit cards in it so I can do Apple Pay. Um, I've also got all kinds of like boarding passes and other stuff that ends up in the wallet. I've got a Starbucks card in there. Is that the same wallet that we're talking about? Or is it going to be some proprietary software that I run you know, download from the app store and that's where I put my digital credentials. Yeah. So um, today it is more of proprietary software, but the industry is going towards, you know, much more of an open wallet that you can use, which is your wallet app into your iPhone. Um, and the idea is that every credential that you have, which has been verified and the whole concept of a verifiable credential, that gets captured into your iPhone wallet which you can then essentially use. Right? So for a, an end user, um, the whole notion needs to be that there has been a credential that's been assigned to me that goes into my wallet. Let's say that's a driver's license or my certificate from a university, my employee record, and then I can use that. I want to touch on this wallet subject because I don't know if it is the same wallet because we have vendor lock-in now. So if I want to change my identity, if I'm stuck on iOS, how do I move to Android if my wallet is a Apple wallet, for example? And the same thing for vice versa, right, with an Android wallet, whether it's Google Pay or something similar like that or Samsung Pay. Is this maybe a role where some of the password manager type solutions might be out there where they're creating their own wallets? Is it a separate financial backed wallet, for example? Um, how do you see this wallet thing kind of playing out? Because I think it gets confusing to say, okay, well, we're talking about getting rid of our physical wallet, but how many virtual or digital wallets am I going to start carrying around? Is it an app for each one, I guess? And maybe we grow into something or maybe we grow out of something. I'm not sure, but I'm curious, Michael, start with you. Like, where do you see wallets just as a general going from a digital perspective? Is it, am I, am I going crazy here thinking like, oh my gosh, now I'm going to have like eight different wallets for eight different things. No, it, it is messy from a uh, standards perspective. So Apple has, uh, created a way to digitize mobile driver's licenses in a couple states, but the only place you can use it is, I think, at the TSA. And um, <clears throat> then you have uh, banks starting to create their own digital identity, like you mentioned. So the viable players today that I see creating wallets globally, like you have SingPass and some government-sponsored ones that are just amazing when you see how well the apps are done and how extensible they are. Here in the U.S., it's... We're 20 years, we're going to be 20 years behind, just like we were for the adoption of chip and pin. How long did it take us to use a trusted credit card for in-person transactions? It took Target getting hacked, and they were doing it everywhere else around the world for 10 years, and they're looking at us around the world and be like, you guys are still using MagStripe? Mm -hmm. I can program that with a $5 piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So um, in my, my opinion, the only entity that can issue a credential reliably about who you are in the physical world is the government. That's why we have driver's licenses and passports. And until they figure out what they want to do, you're going to have all these tactical solutions. 
if Apple could digitize my driver's license and let it be used to open a new Saks Fifth Avenue shopping account, I'd do it in a, in a heartbeat, and so would everybody else. Um, I don't know if, if, if they're not ready to tap into the states to verify that, and they don't want to take on the liability. I would think, you know, that's a pretty slippery slope. So uh, it's very messy right now. You have the MDL standard, and then you have verifiable credentials, which are two different credential you know, standards that are out there. And um, it's just going to take time and market adoption. Uh, timing is everything, as they say. So let's get into a little bit about, I think, the most important part behind the wallet is how do you actually get the credential there and identity proofing in the first place? So if I'm going to have a digital identity, some organization needs to say, okay, we are giving you this a credential. And as Afi mentioned in India, for example, right, there is a couple versions. It sounds like there's a physical document and a digital document that goes along with that. So let's talk about identity proofing. Where do you see this going in the future? Is it multiple credential providers doing this? Do you see something like Bank of America does one thing, uh, Capital One does another, U.S. Bank does another? Do you see maybe consortium of financial services has like their provider versus government has their other education or medical and things like that? I'd like to get into that a little bit and just kind of understand like where do you see that that identity proofing concept going? Um, and maybe if, we, if, if you want to have anything else you want to add to that, feel free. Yeah. So I'll tell you today, the identity proofing is, is primarily meant to check the authenticity of the user as well as your physical, the card, the plastic card. This will evolve more where, and there's a lot of friction. The user has to you know, stand in front of a camera, you have to scan those documents. The more this becomes digitized, let's say there's an MDL in place, all I need to do is to verify with the state in US that this particular MDL has been issued by them, right? And there's a lot of cryptographic ways to essentially do that. Um, so identity proofing is, is the means to create your credential in the wallet. I know that's a mouthful, right? And multi, a bunch of different terms. Um, but the, the, what, is, what is required today is to essentially go through the proofing journey so that now I can trust the credential that is coming in. Right? And, and the path in the future would be that I may have to still do proofing, but I just need to proof you know, if it's actually Jeff who is using this particular wallet. Right? And the credentials are coming from multiple different sources. They're coming from government agencies, and I'm just verifying with them. What do you think is going to be the accelerator where it's like you hit that point and it's like, oh, yeah, this is the killer app or killer use case or whatever it may be that really drives adoption because I think Mike pointed to, you know, unfortunately we tend to be rather slow on some of this stuff, right? We're behind in some areas, um, at least in the U S but other than time budgets, I feel like we have the technology. Everyone for the most part has a smartphone. Lots of services have been digitized. What is the thing that is going to, or maybe it's a couple things that really say, Oh, okay, we've hit this inflection point and, you know, it starts to see exponential growth versus kind of a slower path. So saving dollars, fraud, reduction in fraud is uh, the common driver, whichever industry is adopting it. Um, some of the leading industries are on the financial side because repeated costs on KYC. Um, Canada has a good model in place. There are other, uh, I was at EIC, uh, it was two weeks back, I guess. And there, the discussions of proofing is about five years ahead of what we're talking about now. They're talking about verifiable credentials, how they can essentially use it as well. But yeah, to answer your questions, industry-wise, there are multiple different use cases and examples, KYC. Um, here in US, um, healthcare has come to an inflection point. There is TEFCA. There uh, are you know, other standards in place which essentially say I need to be interoperable with my different networks, with my different providers. And for that, I need to have an identity wallet with a proofed identity in place as well. Um, and then maybe there are a couple more industries. Yeah, the, the healthcare use case is probably the most advanced that I've seen in the United States. So um, there's an organization called the Karen Alliance. And I'm sure you've seen it to some of the shows that we all travel together. And Karen is spelled C-A-R-I-N. Right? It's not some lady's name. <laughs> uh, it stands for Creating Access to Real-Time Information Now. 
And what it means is uh, you are obligated as certain types of providers of, of platforms, for example, Epic Systems, must allow you to download and access your own healthcare records. That's great. So you whip out your Apple or Google wallet today, right now today, and go to health and say, get my data. If the hospital you're going to is an Epic, and there's a couple other providers, Epic required by law now to give you access to your own data. The next stage of that is to then to let that data flow from one doctor to another or one provider to another. You know how painful that is now when you go to a new hospital in Timbuktu and they're faxing papers or just, you know, they can't find you or whatever. So um, this alliance, Karen, has brought together about 40 different payers, providers, and technology providers like us to you know, proof of concepts and put out a big white paper about this. It's real. It's actually happening today. So that's exciting. The use case was there. Protect my data, HIPAA, like those types of principles, digitized and allow me to access it and then share it in a, in a privacy-preserving way. So that's exciting. Uh, and when we see maybe there'll be a, a mandate that requires this in the banking industry. Well, now you're going to have some things starting to happen. Uh, that's one way that the path could be accelerated. Money usually drives stuff. <laughs> so that wouldn't surprise me at all. That's right. Or regulations. Yeah, regulations, um, which you could argue could be driven by money. <laughs> it could be. It could be um, Let's talk a little bit about passwordless because I think this is something that I've been bullish on for oh, a few years now. And this is a space you guys definitely play in as well. Um, if we go by Bill Gates' calendar, the password died in 2006. I don't know about you, but I've already typed in three passwords today alone <laughs> to get into different things. So we're behind there as well, perhaps. Where do we see passwordless going in the next three to five years? Is it did, you know, obviously the FIDO uh, alliance and getting Apple, Google, Microsoft kind of all on the same page from a browser and a mobile perspective was a big win. We're starting to see passkey support roll out. Um, I just set up passkey on my Google account the other day, and it's great. It's fantastic. When are we going to see more of that out there and really get into this passwordless space? Mike, I'll start with you, and then I want to hear, Josefa, your thoughts from from your perspective, how, how you see it going. Yeah, uh, passwordless is here. And um, there's a quote by um, Reid Hoffman, who founded LinkedIn, and you know I think he's part of the PayPal mafia. But he says, if you're not embarrassed by your first release, you waited too long. Well, that did not happen with passkeys. It's out there. It works sometimes. It works a lot of the times, depending who you are, your environment, this or that. So I see it breaking in lots of places, but it's here. And to your point, when it works, it works well. It is the future. Um, the, the FIDO Alliance has really uh, made this, this a reality. Uh, and now, the reason it's possible, it was not possible eight years ago, because we didn't have a place to keep a private key, right? The phones didn't have TPMs, and, and the standards weren't in the browsers to interface it. So that's all here now. Now it's a matter of working out the edge cases to make it uh, really part of our day-to-day. -day. But passwordless is a tool. It is a way for you to present a secure credential. That secure credential needs to be linked back to a real-world identity to really prevent fraud. So what if you have a pass key, but you don't know who's presenting it, right? So a lot of times the fallback comes username, password, you know, when you have to set up or, or rebind or go back to your cloud provider to go fetch the pass key. So I'm gonna, uh, we'll see a, a linking of the identity proofing, which we spent a few minutes on here today, with the issuance of uh, passwordless FIDO pass keys. That together is something we refer to as identity-based authentication without those two together, you have HBA instead of IBA, right? And HBA stands for hope-based authentication, and we don't, we don't like that. So I had to get that one in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's here, and every organization is talking about it. Now, the path to get there, the adoption, is where we see companies differentiating in their customers' journeys. Yeah, and um, on the enterprise side, right, there is a much stronger adoption for passwordless. Number one, they're controlling you know, their users, they control the systems, and the need is just reducing cost too. I have 100 applications or 1,000 applications, right? How many password reset costs that I can eliminate? So definitely from that perspective on the enterprise side, we have seen in the last two years um, that every organization has, has some effort of passwordless. Um, when it comes to on, on your customer side, that's where there has to be a little bit more adoption in place some more edge cases, I don't have a smartphone, I have a flip phone, right? How do I you know, get those users 
into the mix as well. So we can provide much more of a standardized experience. Is there a point where we say, you must be this tall to ride? You must have a smartphone of this level of capability, TPM chip or some other secure enclave, whatever it may be. And, you know, if we keep designing for things that can't support it, I feel like this is where we're at right now is we're not moving because we're still kind of holding out of the past. Yeah. So Jeff, I, I have the mindset that it's not black or white, right? You have to give the option to the user. Um, and that's what uh, we preach to organizations that we talk to, that don't approach any passwordless initiative as I was with passwords yesterday and I'm passwordless tomorrow. Right? I would rather have it as you introduce it and then you have your adoption curve towards it. You incentivize them, you, you tell them that um, you sign up for my, for my password less, right? Uh, you don't have to do X, Y, Z, right? Um, so I, I believe that's the approach that organizations, especially on the consumer or the customer-facing sides, have to adopt. Right? Give both the options to the users, right? I think it's a really important thing. It is, I think that gets, sometimes gets lost in the messaging. It's this binary thing. Either you're passwordless or you're not. Only the Sith deal in absolute. <laughs> I think it's just another arrow in the quiver of an identity professional to say, hey, this is a good use case for passwordless. Let's give that option to people. Some people will take advantage of it. Some people won't. Especially I think right now, I think we're, we're in this adoption cycle, right? The technology is there. The things are there, but people may not be comfortable for whatever reason, or maybe there are different methods for delivery uh, of that information. But if we start providing it at least as an option, great. But to your point, should not be the only option, maybe. Maybe it is, maybe it's not a good option. And maybe I'll put you guys in a spot. Is there a spot today that you guys can think of where pastoralist just doesn't make sense? Take every other factor out of this cost, uh, you know, technology, political ramifications within the organization, whatever that looks like. But can you think of any scenario where pastoralist just is not a good solution today? Well, the definition of passwordless is, is one challenge. Uh, so I'm doing a talk in about two hours, and it's the five either things to consider uh, as you go passwordless or the five pitfalls to avoid. Um, and uh, one of them is defining what your passwordless goals are. Right? Is it If you Google, I, I, I did a little slide where it says, here's GPT's definition of passwordless, and here's Claude's, right? They're one of the competitors. They're completely different. And Merriam-Webster says to be without passwords. Right? So, so it's so <laughs> vague. Um, I, I mean, there's no excuse that in any industry where you couldn't, as an example, if you do it right, have a webcam and just walk in front of it, minority report style, and boom, you're either through a choke point or logged into a terminal and you're good to go, like on a manufacturing floor. I'm wearing gloves. I got a helmet on. Like, there's all these edge cases that you do need to handle. And um, I think we can get there 80, 85% pretty quickly. That 15% will be. Uh, you'll need like four or five different options to be able to handle them. I don't know specifically of a of an example, but like the manufacturing floor, if you're mm -hmm. a full get up and you got to do stuff, there's not a good way to interface with any technology. Yeah, well, it took a while for the iPhone to catch up with wearing masks. Yeah, right. You know, it couldn't do the face ID unless you brought the mask down. Depending on your setting, that was acceptable or not acceptable. So what I wanted to bring up was the user experience because it, you know, I'm. I'm pretty hot to trot on the pass key. I think it's a major step forward. I think that the user experience committee over at Fido Alliance is doing a group, yeoman's work to get commonality in terms of how registration for pass keys goes and things like that. But also if you sit through a demo, the four of us are all like, whoa, that's really not that hard. But then you know my lens, which is, I think, could my dad do this? And I'm like, <laughs> he, would, he would say, forget this. I'm not, once he hit a wall, he'd be done. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, it's the catch 22, which is it, it kind of has to get to ubiquity. The catch 22 part being you can't get to ubiquity until it's like everywhere, but it's hard for it to become mm -hmm. commonplace and easy for people until it gets to that point. So you have that that uncomfortable transition, which I think we're just in the beginning of now to get to the point where people are comfortable using the pass keys and registering for it and understand what's going on or not having to understand what's going on. But if you are 
going in, it's like, okay, use your Microsoft Authenticator and do this and do that, and it only works within this realm. I mean, that's going to be confusing. And I use my dad as an example, but even for other people in my life, in my life who are not technology people, it's they don't want to understand all what's going on. They just want to get into their service. Of course, they don't want to have their information compromised. Nobody wants that. But they don't want to have to jump through hurdles. So that's where we have to get. And I, so that's what this transition is all about. One important thing an analyst told me, um, and he said that we always look at the problems, you know, from a first world perspective. And um, if you look at Latin America, if you look at Asia, uh, there's a large volume of users, right? You cannot expect them to have a passwordless experience similar to what we have. Um, so it's important to understand, you know, what their challenges are, phones, etc. And they have MFA requirements. They're just introducing that. Governments are introducing that. So they may still go with the legacy method of a username, password, and an OTP. You introduce more friction for them. Right? And in those geographies, if, you know, uh, for the small users who are more tech savvy, you lessen the friction. Right? You don't have to do it three times just to send $100 from one user to the other. Um, but you have to understand the audience right, and introduce it. And, and they will get to the adoption curve just based on you know, more technology adoption, et cetera. But knowing, uh, knowing the user, knowing the geography that you play in is important as well. Yeah, I think you know, in terms of the transition, hopefully it doesn't take as long as this, but you know, think about how people did banking when we were kids you know, a long, long time ago. They went to the bank, they stood in line, they went to the teller. And now banks have discouraged that so much, right? You might even have to pay a fee to go see a teller, right? They want you to use the ATM or bank online. The people, the, our parents, you know, many of them are still around and they just had to adopt, adapt, but their parents are no longer around. But, you know, so I think it hopefully doesn't take as long to transition from passwords as it has from physical bank visits, but I kind of see the analogy. Yeah, it has to be indistinguishable from magic, really, for, for them to be able to do it. Like you walk up and you do that first time of Apple Pay, you're a little leery, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're like, holy crap, this is, <laughs> I'm doing this every time. I think that'll happen with every generation eventually. I might be able to leave my wallet at home and that would be a great thing. It's just carry my phone, yeah. I can pay for everything, and if I get pulled over, all my documents are on, my my wallet on my phone yeah that'd be fantastic who wouldn't want that well where am i going to keep my mary's mountain cookie punch card so i get my <laughs> six punch card <laughs> tell them to go verifiable credentials for yeah. crying out loud exactly right <laughs> for crying out one loud. more app on your phone <laughs> <laughs> yes there you go mike you've been jotting about a bunch of notes did we hit everything that you wanted to cover today well there's um i, I mentioned biometrics right it, it really is an enabler when done right and I want to point out something that not too many people know about yet. In March of this year, the White House put out a paper. Uh, it's called the National Strategy to Advance Privacy, Preserving uh, Data and Sharing Analytics, PPDSA, right? another acronym that we need. And in this 45-page report, they talk about what it's going to take for the government to use biometrics in a safe way. And they mentioned two concepts, privacy-enhancing techniques or PETs, and privacy preserving data sharing and analytics. So how do you collect biometrics or use biometrics in a way that lets you prove who somebody is without storing a bunch of photos in a database, right? Where bad things could happen. Because when you go to the IRS to pay your taxes, do you trust that that face isn't gonna be used against you in a court of law because you, I don't know, look like somebody else who got, you know, committed a crime in New York City? Nobody's this good looking. That's right, that's <laughs> right. And indistinguishable from from the real Jeff. So um, these, these are, uh, there's a couple technologies now, like uh, there's a concept of something called homomorphic encryption, neural networks and these types of things. There, the word homomorphic encryption is mentioned in this paper over 20 times. We are rolling out a technology that lets you look into a camera and within one second at the edge can tell you if it's Jeff, yes or no. And send back uh, basically a, the equivalent of a public key to a server, you know, like do all this cryptographic stuff without any server side images being captured. 
So imagine, I, you know, it's kind of minority report, but if you knew the bit that the good guys couldn't use your face, all there was was a bunch of jumbled numbers in it, in it that they couldn't do anything with, that'd be a game-changing um, um, way to think about it. And the reason that's important, we're talking about wallets, and we're talking about pass keys and private keys, recovery. We didn't talk about account recovery. What happens when you lose your wallet? My house burned down, my Android, my USB, UB keys, all these things are gone. How do you start from scratch if your private keys are gone? Well, um, there's, there's technologies that will allow us to potentially recover that using multi-party computing and using your biometrics to be able to recover your identity. And it's going to be a cat and mouse game with things like deepfakes and AI. We didn't talk about AI either. There's a place for that in, in, the, uh, in the world, and maybe that's a whole separate episode, right? Um, so I'm, I'm really bullish on biometrics and age verification too is really hard and dealing with minors' identity. We didn't talk about that. How do you prove that somebody's 15 and not 13 to get in online and use Facebook? There's new legislation that came out. Uh, they're trying to pass a law that says you can't use Facebook if you're under 18. Right? You know, like that's pretty. That's pretty serious. Um, Is so anybody that's, under 18 actually using Facebook though? Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> a little bit too late, maybe. It's for the old people now. So yeah, these things: the, the privacy preserving, the biometrics, age verification. We're, and, and also, we didn't talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Who's ever touched on it a bit with like, you know, the ability for everybody to be able to use these technologies. So these are things we're working on. Kintera has, uh, has a whole DEI working group. Like, how do we do NIST 863-3 with somebody who has no records? <laughs> well, it's hard, but uh, we have to figure it out. On the internet, everybody knows you're a dog. <laughs> That's right. I actually think, just as you were talking about those, the White House paper and talking about these different different privacy initiatives. I think that could be one of the biggest stumbling blocks to, you know, self sovereign identity and, and a lot of these things overall. What I don't look, I'm not like a extreme privacy hawk, but I also see what's happened with like this cookie thing, right? You had every website, it throws up a bar, it's like, do you want to block cookies or accept cookies? If you click block cookies, forget about it. Nothing on that website is going to work. So if it just becomes like, hey, do you give us the right to take all your data from your digital identity or you want it blocked and you can't use our service, you can't pay for your utility bill online or check your usage or whatever. Um, so to me, privacy has the greatest potential to become stumbling block because what happens is uh, when the needle goes too far in terms of, you know, not respecting privacy, then the regulations try to come back and they end up overcompensating. Sometimes they become ineffective like this thing with the, with the cookies. Yeah, it's, you see that in the enterprise as well. You know, you have this amazing password list tool. You got a, a phone, it's secure, and you used your MDM to deploy it. And then some employees are allowed to say, I don't want to use my phone. Uh, make me have a corporate phone or they don't, you don't even have to make them do that. And I don't know. I'm kind of old school. It's like the way you raise kids today versus yesterday or whatever, but don't work here. <laughs> but you can't do that, right? It's not the culture you want to create. So yeah, there's, there's people that won't turn Face ID on their phone and then FIDO doesn't work without Face ID. I don't think you can use uh, FIDO pass keys with a six digit pin, can you? I, I think that's one of the devil it's in the one details. Of the requirements, thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, people won't, why won't people use Face ID? Because they're afraid cops are going to pull them over or they go to the other country and they're going to wave the phone in front of their face and unlock their data. And I mean, it's pretty tin foil hat kind of stuff, but to each their own. So yeah, it's, it's these, these technologies, people can say no to them and sometimes you have to let them operate anyway. Wasn't that just progress though? I mean, people were against cars, right? And the phone. Luddites. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, everything, you know, it's, it's the great cycle. I think of human and inventions, right? right? There's always, change is hard, right? You're, you're changing up something. Uh, we see it all the time. Um, that got kind of deep. So why don't we end on a lighter note? <laughs> <laughs> we're in Vegas, we're at a Deniverse, And I feel like if you've been here maybe more than a handful of times, a couple of times, three times, maybe you have like a secret spot that you just kind of like go to. Maybe not a lot of people know about it or it's just, you know, a, a safe place that you can go to and cry over your losses, <laughs> right? Or celebrate your winnings. I'm curious if you guys have any sort of kind of secret Vegas spot, knowing that it might not be a secret for too much longer after it gets out. Um, Hazefa, what do you, when you come to Vegas, do you have like a spot that you like to go hang out, chill, food, drink, 
when show, it comes to it Vegas, um, the the spot I really want to chill is in my hotel room because <laughs> <laughs> there's it's too underrated. much walking. <laughs> but um, if you want a spot, this is not a secret, but Heart Attack Grill, just for the experience. Which grill? Heart Attack Grill. I don't know that one. Oh, okay, right. Try it's that. It's a secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell me about it. Um, you can eat whatever you like. Right. Um, the portion sizes are huge, so just from an experience standpoint, go there, right, and um, order anything on the menu. You, usually it works, right, if you had a few drinks as well, <laughs> <laughs> so it helps for the hangover. Putting yeah. the heart attack into yeah. the heart attack rail. All right, I'll check that one out. Mike, you got a secret spot for us? Well, there's, uh, there's one that's been on my list forever, but you go to these shows and you're running 18 hours a day and don't get to go out, so we end up going to the steakhouse in the lobby, right? But, uh, and I love a good steak, but there's one that I hope to try tonight or tomorrow night. It's called Other Mama, Asian Fusion. Uh, and I was just looking this up before the show. It's uh, out on Sahara Avenue. It's in a strip mall along with two other Chinese restaurants. And um, it's Asian Fusion and it's so hard to find that they, they give a description of look for a little set of <laughs> chopsticks on a sign, like in a cross, right? And uh, that's how you find it. Like you, you will try to find it and can't find it. And um, it supposedly has an amazing menu. And something they, they said here that I, I'm curious about is Mongolian beef cheek bao, right? So it's one of those things if you're, sorry if you're vegetarian, but... Uh, Foodie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'm uh, hoping to get to there and I'll... I'll I'll toot about it if I uh, if I happen to get there. <laughs> uh, it sounds like it's a, almost like a speakeasy. <laughs> you right. have to look for the symbol or whatever. Exactly. Jim, what's your uh, secret spot? I've got to go with one with secret in the name. It's called Secret Pizza. I knew you were going to pick that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pizza place over at the Cosmo. And even if you know where it is, where it's supposed to be, you have a hard time finding it, right? Because it's like, it's not marked. There's a long hallway that is more like an alleyway that you used to get back there. Once you're inside, it feels like a real New York City pizzeria, and the pizza is exactly that style. So as somebody who lived in the New York metro and got, actually in New Jersey, and got great New York style pizza all the time, but moved down south and it's really hard to come by now, um, that's one spot that I always hit. You can get the full 16 inch pizza, Bring it back to your room, get a two liter of, you know, your favorite sugary soda and just feel like the good old days. Feel like you're a teenager wolfing down a pizza again. Nice. And what's what yours, Jeff? Yeah, what about you, Jeff? <laughs> uh, you know, I got a few. I think it's my new, it's probably my new favorite spot. And I talked about it in our last episode was that um, place in the Ahern Hotel. It's on the north end of the Strip. There's no casino, so it was totally dead inside when it was in there Monday night. My brother introduced it to me. It's called Ottimo Gourmet Kitchen and Pizzeria. Uh, I talked about the chicken, which was fantastic. Best chicken I've ever had. Um, but pork chop was amazing. There was a, um, um, a ribeye that was fantastic. We had a, uh, a margarita pizza that was fantastic. And it's just, it's, it's kind of a newish place, I guess, but not many people know about it, so... So you've been there once. Been there once. You've had a steak, yeah. a chicken, well, pork we chop, samples, and pizza. <laughs> right. So I got chicken. Uh, my brother got a pork chop. Um, we had a ribeye. And then as an appetizer, we had a margarita pizza. <laughs> a small one. Because we kind of got there at that weird time where it's like in between lunch and dinner. So they have like an all-day menu. And then they had a dinner menu. And so we had half an hour to kill, basically, before <laughs> dinner started. I was like, oh, let's just get a pizza. And I had just flown in from Atlanta. I was starving at that point. So by, for, for me, I was already three hours ahead into the future. So um, we sat there and connected and have, you know, had a good old time. But it's just a little place. And because there's no casino, there's no foot traffic. You just kind of have to know about it. And it was fantastic. Definitely recommend it. Amazing. Good. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's, what, um, that's what Vegas is good for, these, these kind of little spots. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and wrap it up for this one. Um, Mike, Zafo, thanks for joining us. I'll have links to your guys' LinkedIn profile on our show notes, as well as One Cosmos, uh, onecosmos.com. That's one K-O-S-M-O-S.com. <clears throat> you can find us on the web as I get all choked up here just talking about password lists. Uh, <laughs> IDACpodcast.com. Uh, we're on Twitter at IDAC Podcasts. We're on Mastodon at IDAC Podcast at infosec.exchange. And, of course, you can always connect with Jim and I here at LinkedIn. It's been great connecting with a lot of listeners who have kind of come up and 
um, said hello and uh, said thank you for bringing back the guitar riff. <laughs> People like the guitar riff, so we'll roll with it uh, until the next one. So. Um, yeah, so don't forget to like, subscribe, do all that stuff to help us out, get the word out that people uh, can listen to the sultry, dulcet tones of a sweet identity talk here on Identity at the Center. So uh, we'll go ahead and leave it there for this week. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll talk to you in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com and find us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. See you next time on Identity at the Center.